This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Peggy O'Brien, Director of Education at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. In the 1980s, Peggy pioneered the establishment of the library's educational programs and then moved on to other management positions in education-based concerns, including her role as Senior Vice President of Education Programming and Services for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. She returned to the Folger in 2013, where, with her team, she has continued to develop better ways for students to encounter Shakespeare through a process or arc of learning called the Folger Method. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Hello, Peggy. Good afternoon to you. It's my good, it's my good morning. Is your good afternoon. Uh, we are so delighted to have you here. I wanted to start out by making uh, a couple of points here. Without the K-12 teaching of Shakespeare across the globe, Shakespeare could almost be lost to public consciousness or of a far, far lesser presence in the public mind. To power an institution as large as the Folger and its world-class holdings and its programs over time, to do this, uh, you have to engage children, teenagers, people in schools, to, do, to not do that would be like trying to power a car without gas or electricity, and perhaps without even major component parts of the engine. So I think the Folger's great success in the past decades is due to its understanding of the importance of retaining the superb team of educators, a team that you head up, one that has been ceaselessly inventive over the years in providing on-site programs, and in more recent years, abundant online tools and resources to help teachers adopt a student-centered approach to the learning of Shakespeare proper, a process that also more broadly cultivates self-expression, self-confidence, critical thinking skills, and one that, when things work, inspires young people throughout their lives on whatever path they choose. Now, this process at the Folger is called the Folger Method, and may we ask you to explain to us what the Folger Method is. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you having a conversation about this. Thanks for saying all those lovely things about the Folger's education work. Um, the Folger Method is simply a way of teaching. It started out as a way of teaching Shakespeare. Um, now we know that lots of teachers who know this method use it to teach. Uh, and I'm talking about, well, I'm talking about middle school and high school uh, uh, more in the US. Um, but they use it to teach other kinds of complex literature, complex, what we call complex text in, the, in, that, in our universe. It's a way of teaching that starts with the language. If you talk to folks that, and you say to teachers or you say to kids, what's the hardest thing? And they say, oh, it's the language. And kids say, why, you know, why didn't we write in English for heaven's sake? I mean, why do we, um, this is hard. And what we know and what we've learned is that you start right with the language and you get the language in students' mouths. And we teach teachers how to do this, how to teach this way. You get the language in kids' mouths and that starts to break down a lot of um, assumptions or fear that they're not gonna understand it, that he only uses words that are really complicated, that they're never, it's never gonna be accessible. And also, and then that leads to, quickly leads to, why do I have to learn this anyway? But if you can start making sense of it yourself, then you see, ooh, there's some juicy stuff in there that to, to get us thinking about. And I should just say that the Folger Method started, so I taught high school English in a District of Columbia public high school, two District of Columbia public high schools, Washington, D.C. And, um, and what has become the Folger Method started in my classroom. And I was a second year teacher. I had a class of really, really bright students. And we had these ancient anthologies, these big fat books and the and British literature, British literature still in many schools is the 12th grade English curriculum. Um, and in this anthology was Macbeth. And I said to them, I was probably 23 years old. 
and I said, I said to them, we, we could read Macbeth or we could read the big one. And they said, what's the big one? And I said, Hamlet, which at the time I, I thought was the big one. I don't think I do anymore. But, um, and so we had to have some bake sales and raise some money and buy books. And we started on Hamlet. And these kids were completely motivated. They were also great readers. There were no barriers, really, none of the usual barriers. And we started to read the first scene in Hamlet. And I, I was teaching it as I was taught it in high school. We read up and down the rows, your Bernardo, your Marcellus, all that. Mm -hmm. And about partway through that, and that's a really great first scene also, as opposed to some other Shakespeare plays. And so about halfway through, I said, ah, okay, so what do you think? And they said, what is this? This is terrible. <laughs> and I thought, oh, dang. It, and so, and, and really these were motivated, these were really motivated students. So 17, 18 years old. And so I said, really? And they said, what? They also said some other more colorful language, but I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave that out. And so I thought, and that's when I really learned what the role of a teacher is. Like I was the piece that was between them, their eagerness and their motivation and a text that they could really learn something juicy from. And that's a great story, right? Um, so I said, well, it's Friday. So I'm gonna, let's, I'll have something better about this on Monday. And, and I was really at my wits end. I knew nothing about theater, nothing about drama, nothing about, I mean, I know a little bit more now, but, but not my field. I was an English major, liberal arts college. Um, but I thought, well, he wrote plays. So, and he knew what he was doing, writing plays. And so let's start there. So I cut, I chunked up Hamlet into scenes and it made, it made all the difference. And then some years later, I ended up almost by accident at the Folger Shakespeare Library where there was no education department. But once we started to do education work there, I started to continue the development of all that it, with, with the help of some wonderful scholars and some terrific actors. It's based on a set of principles mm -hmm. that make a lot of sense. It captures the interest and the engagement of kids of all ability levels. And especially now, because we're in a changed world, is the idea of giving up Shakespeare worship. You know, get him off the pedestal and get him talking to other writers um, or other, other writers of different genders and centuries and all that. So it's a much more interesting way to teach. And the students, the teacher's the architect and the students are making their own connections with the language and that makes all the difference. So yeah. In a nutshell, what it is. Yeah, and uh, there's so many inventive ways that the Folger uh, has uh, laid out uh, lesson plans. Uh, you also, in these programs, you do professional development. Uh, I spoke years ago for a group of teachers uh, who were on an NEH sponsored program that you right. had, had set up. Uh, there's also what's called the wide world uh, that I like a lot because uh, right. I, it, there's a global theme to this series uh, and not just American, not just UK, a theme that goes across the world. And then there's live Folger teaching. Those are four things that are featured on your website, but right. uh, quite a lot that's offered on site and also uh, uh, virtually. Yes. Our education programs were mainly in person. Um, I mean, we had a few things on the Folger website, but not a lot. And, and this was pre COVID. Mm -hmm. We heard from a lot of teachers, you know, we don't, we don't want to wait for a workshop. We would do workshops around the country and we, and actually we, perhaps we will resume doing workshops around the country, but they said, we don't want to wait for a workshop uh, necessarily. And so where can we get information from you all and get teaching plans and get some scholarship information and so forth. Um, and so we started to put this website together. We had a lot of input from working teachers. We feel like I, I, we really do know that people who teach K-12 and, and most of the Shakespeare that happens in that zone is middle school and high school. So that's like sixth grade through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Teachers who teach those grades, we know do the most important work on earth. You know, and that goes back to how you started, Tom, is, is lots of students wouldn't be in college classes if they hadn't had a chance to fall in love with literature. 
um, or fall in love with whatever they were they were studying in, in middle school or in high school. It has a huge impact. So we, our job is to serve those teachers. And we also find ourselves serving a lot of college professors too, because they're interested in the how of teaching. Um, but we think they're really important. So, but mainly our, our programs were, we would bring in, they were in person, we would bring in teachers from around the country that our NEH Teaching Shakespeare Institute is NEH funded. And that's the, what you mentioned, Tom. Um, lots of programs with local teachers and students as well. But as I say, even before COVID, we began to realize that we should put a lot more stuff online. And so we, we also started a teacher, we have a membership for teachers. I think we're the only rare book library that has a teacher membership. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of that that's online is accessible. And it's a website called Folger Teaching, specifically for teachers, teaching.folger.edu. And so all of that is there and, ha and has been there what we learned through COVID is, so COVID hits and in March, 2020, schools start to shut down all, almost all schools um, in the United States uh, became virtual. Oh, and well beyond the United States became virtual. And so we said to teachers, what can, we had these regular kind of chat meetings on the last Wednesday of every month. And, and that the last Wednesday of March after school shut down, 150 teachers showed up for this chat and we said what can we do and they said you can have meetings like this every week we said every week they said every week and make them longer i've never heard a teacher ever say make this meeting longer and give us some things that we can do online mm -hmm. and we knew we were we had some of that stuff in our in our arsenal um but it, in some ways, it was like if you've ever taught a class and you felt like you were one page ahead of the students, it was a little bit like that. And but they were all on Zoom, and and we had teachers up and and you know shouting Shakespeare lines at each other and do, you know working all this stuff. And it proved to be very very helpful to them. We also the Folger um, Library released at no cost. Uh, audio versions of I think we have six or seven plays that our actors when they came to to work on the stage um, they, they also recorded audio versions we released those at no cost also we have a video of a really wonderful production of Macbeth that teachers really like we also released that for no cost and we I was one of the people who talked to great performances at uh, at PBS and said please can you put outside a paywall the public theater's production of Much Ado About Nothing, which is with an all, all African-American cast. And so we put some resources together, but we also learned for ourselves that you could really do some good teaching um, online and that teachers really appreciated it and they used the, they used the stuff that we had. So that also then led us to expand the, all the offerings that we have um, on that website. In, in addition to that, we also know we've learned through our work since the very beginning that teachers, if you are teaching in a middle school or a high school, the time that you have to investigate scholarship is practically zero because you are teaching and then you're going home with a book bag full of papers to correct and all that stuff or your laptop with all those papers on your laptop. Um, and so the idea of scholars giving teachers new ways to look at old plays, you know, new perspectives. And also in the United States, often you teach the same play every year. If you mm -hmm. teach ninth grade, it's pretty mm -hmm. sure that Romeo is on your menu. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so the idea of new perspectives uh, on these plays is so welcome. And so we also have a continuing series of those kinds of things and as part of our professional development. Yeah, th this is, this is great, and I may want to return to the challenges of pandemic, uh, and the, of course, we will talk a little bit later about the Folger, uh, recent renovations at the Folger, but I wanted to make the, uh, I think it's a salient point, when in, in the UK, I'm certain in other, you know, Australia, New Zealand, whatever, other English, uh, first language English cultures, uh, North America, uh, Shakespeare is very ubiquitous, is ubiquitous in middle and high school. Uh, in uh, Japan, where I am now, literature is not taught in high school. There's, right. there's no literary education, and there's a lot of Shakespeare, and there's a, a troupe that just uh, we thought had dissolved but came back up, Shakespeare for children, and they do some pretty wow. exquisite stuff. Uh, now, you know, it's, it's uh, cut down a bit, and it's in Japanese, 
But the, uh, the thing is, on the college level where I am, these strategies that you're uh, offering to middle and high school teachers are fully transferable. Uh, I think, I mean, a second language situation, we have excellent English speakers, but everybody is in an ex is in a second language situation when they first approach Shakespeare. You well know, said, well first said, get, yeah. Know, dropped in medias race in, in the first act of Hamlet where you're expected to, to catch up because something's already been going on. There's a dead king before the play even starts. There's right. some noise and drum and drum beats coming from the north. There's, there's a ghost out there and you have to catch up. And it's so hard if it's not, if you don't see a stage production to envision that from the text. And I think that's what you're talking about. You have to, uh, you have to get that into it. But if you just say, to the kids go home and start reading <laughs> nobody will they won't make no. it through a page uh i don't think i did in high school and i right. do remember in high school you know some people have had stories you know in in our generation had some terrible stories about being taught shakespeare i actually had some uh a couple of very um, engaging teachers one of whom and this is low tech but there was a vinyl record king lear and, you know, he would ask us to read parts and so forth, but we could hear professional actors reciting lines and that worked, you know, right there in class. And of course, all the all the uh, boys in class loved the scene with Kent cursing Oswald. I think we all memorized oh, that great. scene. Oh, I you love know, that. What, what a portal. You, you talk about portals, you know, but it's, there's something there for everybody. Uh, women, men, uh, young, old, whatever. There's something there for everyone. Yes, I love, and that's funny, I love that, that speech is a big favorite. Um, and, and I think, you know, for us students speaking the words, um, you know, what we say to teachers all the time is it's about the process. It's about getting those words in kids' mouths and then that helps to get ideas into their heads. And so in terms of learning, I mean, we think a lot about how people learn and people learn in very different ways, obviously, but we would much rather have a student saying those words than we would then to have their first pass at those words listening to somebody else. Um, not that those those that recordings and and audio tapes are not are not important. I, I also think I think those are they are especially important. I've always thought they were especially important if they were done with actors who are using their own accents with actors who are not in that, whatever that's called, that mid-Atlantic English that actors are supposed to speak Shakespeare in. I don't know whose idea that was. Um, but but speaking, speaking them, speaking Shakespeare in the, in the accent that they use in their family or that they have at home or how they speak generally, then that also sends a very clear message that Shakespeare is for everybody and Shakespeare is for everybody. And we want students to bring their whole selves to this work, including their own culture and how it all translates in their culture. So yeah, it's exciting. Well, what is, you You are attuned, a what is typical for middle school? What would be the play choices in a typical middle school? So, so Shakespeare's in the US is taught less in middle school than in high school. Uh -huh. Though in high schools now, people are really questioning, should we be teaching? Shakespeare? Should we teach as much Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. In middle school, often the play is Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. That's for, what I for thought. reasons yeah. that are kind of obvious. Of course, there's a whole dark side to there Midsummer is. Night's Dream. <laughs> I've, I've a total dark side. I'm going, whoa, I'm, you know, some right. of this. Yeah. But the dark side is not traveling in middle school. In middle school, it's all, you know, on the upside. And so for kids first, um, you know, for a first uh, first take at some of this stuff, lots of schools do that. Also, there are there are some terrific teachers who cut Macbeth. Macbeth is also kind of a fave in um, like around sixth grade kids who are twelve. Um, Macbeth, cut, yeah, for, for yeah, 12, well, 12 year olds. Yeah, well, it's, oh. yeah, I mean, obviously cut. I mean, not no language modernized. The whole. No fear, Shakespeare. I have a lot to. Yeah. Actually, I don't have a lot to say about that, except that it's, um, you know, it's supposedly modernized text, and it is. I say to teachers all the time, it is created by people who do not think your students are smart enough 
to get the real thing and they they don't think you're smart enough to teach it and none of those neither of those things is true um but yeah the uh the idea of of cutting you know using the text that we have as far as we know what Shakespeare wrote and then having cut scenes from Macbeth or cut scenes from something else that's really useful for students especially if they're starting out yeah well talk talk about dark themes uh and uh, and but then again I don't think there's any literature out there worth its salt even comic literature even lighter literature that doesn't have that sort of thing. That's what you want students to uh, experience, you know, vicariously to go through. And you just talk to people over and over again who, uh, you know, a book that they liked in their, in those years, uh, those formative years. And, you know, someone, uh, you know, who says, well, we shouldn't teach Shakespeare at all. Well, who else, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, what else? And uh, I was, uh, I spoke uh, recently with James Shapiro, who just wrote on Shakespeare in America. Right. And we, get the, we get the question a lot over here. And I'll just repeat what I said there and, and what he agrees with, too, is that it, it was the, the, the foundational principles were, were people who, who wrote those, who established that, who unified the country, were primarily uh, subjects of the crown before the revolution and had been subjects of the crown for gener generations in some cases. And Shakespeare was just national literature in, in a way, even though they're colonials. So for a long time, Shakespeare had been in America, of course, the King James Bible, Milton, those things. So it was already Americanized before there was America. And so it, it's not like uh, you know, <laughs> we suddenly were a, a nation that was 100 years old and a bunch of teachers said, hey, let's go over to another country and get their writer and start teaching it here, you know, because we really don't have our writers. It was already here. It was part of, of thing. It was part of the consciousness of, you know, uh, John Quincy Adams, of uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And, you know, it was just already here. So, I, I think that's the best argument for retaining Shakespeare in school. And I think there's also an argument for branching out using Shakespeare uh, as a portal to branch out to uh, other authors on your med website that you mentioned, more contemporary authors. But the ones that you mentioned, you, Shakespeare's tough, but they can be very tough too, you know. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, one of the things, the questions that teachers are asking now about Shakespeare has to do with the fact that he is a dead white guy, right? And so one basic question is, well, he's a dead white guy and everybody's read him for a million years, so do we have to keep reading him? That's a question. Um, but the other, the other question is how much, my question is to schools is how much Shakespeare are kids reading and how many dead white guys you're a live white guy so like no offense Tom to you but like how many dead I'm, I'm white happy guys? to be on the on the lip on that this side of it <laughs> me, me too me too on your behalf. As, long as, as long as possible there you go um <laughs> but how much are they reading so so there are, are actually some high schools in this country where kids are reading not anything by by any author of color or by anybody who's even alive. Oh, really? And now? Now? Now. See, I, I've been out of the States. Uh, I've been in Japan this time for 20 years. And I was uh, yeah. five years before that. So we met actually about 30 years ago. Right. Bolger. And we right. were talking exactly about that kind of thing then 30 years ago. Right. And you, you would think that by now that even in slow incremental uh, progress towards these goals, these ends, but you're saying that there's the progress that progress has been made in places, but not in other other places. Some places, not in other places. Right. Well, schools schools are you know schools are institutions that move slowly, and school districts and school systems, and they and of course now in the United States, there's the whole critical race theory conversation. School boards are all talking oh. about whether people should, you know, should teach race, which is a kind of a different thing. But, but um, yeah, things move very slowly, but people have become, and this is before, I mean, there was a real, has been a real racial reckoning since the death of George Floyd. But even before that, teachers were starting to say, wait a second, 
you know, what are our students, our students are not reading things that are, that they should read. And, and so now, for example, many schools will, kids will read Beloved by Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there are some schools where they don't read, they don't read any James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. um, or they don't read, uh, they read some poets, but not many it's poets of color. They don't read Frederick Douglass. You should read like a Frederick Douglass, who, who was a big fan of Shakespeare, by the way, we know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, but there's, there's a sweep of literature and, and my, uh, my, my friend and hero, Dr. Jocelyn Chadwick talks about the sweep of literature and how students should have access to all of that mm -hmm. so they can get a sense about what, who the, you know, what they like and who they read and all that stuff. So, so the questions that are being asked by English departments in the States now, I, I think are exactly the right questions. Mm -hmm. You always want to stop at some point midstream and say, okay, are we doing the best kind of job we can do? Um, and then, so that's important to us. I think, and we are totally encouraged, the Fulger is totally encouraging of that. And then also the how of teaching Shakespeare. So you, so you can use some of the things that are going on in this, these plays to bring up very interesting and contemporary conversations about, um, about gender, about race, about power, about transformation, all the kinds of things that are juicy and important in life. Um, Ian Smith, Professor Ian Smith from Lafayette College in Pennsylvania in the U.S. is really w one of our favorite people. And he talks about the, the, the then and there and the here and now. Mm -hmm. And so these plays were written then and there, but we are looking at them. Our contemporary selves, our contemporary students are looking at them here and now. And so how, because when we teach it, we don't want to turn the crank and take kids back in time Mm -hmm. entirely we want them to be able to see how these we want them to be able to discover how these sit with them um in the in the world that they live in now and that's exciting i mean that's a wonderful way to teach yeah well let's let's probe into this a little bit uh the recent uh kind of out i i read news in Tokyo. And so I spoke with a friend of mine who lives in Charleston, South Carolina recently. And I said, what's the thing with masks? Do, like if you have a mask on, is someone yelling at you on the street? And if you don't have a mask on, somebody is yelling at you get yelled at no matter what you do. He goes, no, it's not like that. I said, but looking at the news stories, it looks like there's some angry person in Texas or someone in New York City angry, yelling at somebody across the street. Uh, so when the critical race theory uh, comes through via various uh, media, of course, uh, now I think there was a recent election in Virginia where that was the pivotal thing. Yes. And those and yeah. parents, parents were very upset. And uh, a reporter, uh, Matt Ta Taibbi, went and talked to people. And it was really not about that. It was about something else having to do with uh uh, parents feeling that their their children weren't getting prepared for college uh, and these were uh, right uh, so that, that's a very complicated thing and i've just encouraged people to, to read up on that but uh i i think that there's an interesting thing going on now with social media where there's a there's a uh a knee-jerk reaction and it's coming from a lot of directions not just uh let's say white conservatives who don't want their children to learn how bad they are being white, right, which is part right. of the narrative. There's also I read in New Mexico where they're dealing with this in schools, um, an effort to teach race in a way that can be expanded, can be expanded throughout the country. But some uh, families from uh, Latin backgrounds are saying, listen, I don't want my seven year old kid to think of us and our family because of our background, because we're bilingual. And, uh, and we have this heritage to think that we're victims, we're not victims, we're hardworking people, we're Americans, you know, and right. so they're getting pushbacks from from there in New Mexico. And I've uh, in, in certain uh, black intellectual circles, too, there's some pushback about the about the way in which things might be taught. But I, I truly, truly believe that what is not happening is that people are not going in and talking to teachers. And that parents and teachers are not communicating enough. I'm sure they are a lot, but not enough. And I think that everybody will settle down 
if, if you that, that direct line between parents and teachers and you know my children never had a teacher who said no I'm not going to talk to you Tom about what we do in school <laughs> you know, it was always please come in and get involved you know your parental support that's that's so much of uh you know everything and uh, as a teacher if a parent uh now in college you don't have this as much but uh just keeping the lines open, letting people transparency. This is what we do. This is what has worked. Sometimes we fail. So, you know, give us your input, but you don't have to take a bunch of people and, ch and charge into a school board meeting because people on the school board aren't teaching those kids day to day, you know, they're, they're developing policy and so forth. So I, I don't know, is that a possible solution just to encourage more parent and teacher interaction and communication? It could, I mean, I think it could be. Um, I do think there's a, there's a there's a floating reality uh, that if you are in K twelve education is something that you see all the time, and that is there are lots of people who really feel that they're experts in education <laughs> because they went to school, and yeah. I, and I don't mean that I'm not I'm saying that perfectly seriously, right? They yeah. people went to school they had a good experience in school, they had a, whatever kind of experience they had, they went to school, so they know about it. And, and so there are a lot of people, not just parents, but a lot of people who feel that they are experts, and they know, they know, they just know the how and everything. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is that now everything in the United States is so charged up. I mean, it's so politically charged uh the Folger is three blocks from the u.s capitol yeah and so we and so we are we are more aware than most institutions well i mean we're right across from the supreme court we're right we're diagonally kitty corner from the supreme court and across one yeah. street from um the library of congress so yes. on january 6 2021 it was all happening you know and actually i live not very far from the Folger, so um, so if you were trying to, you know, think that maybe the country wasn't as polarized as it appeared, it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, uh, you know, we're, I don't think we're doing a very good job listening to each other. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, for long, long years, kids who read um, certain things in, in English class, I mean, English class is what I know about the best, right? So kids who read things in English class, there were parents and now, and I cannot think of a good example now. And when we're finished, I will think of a hundred good examples. But, <laughs> yeah. but there, there would be a book that a parent would object to mm -hmm. on some, on maybe religious grounds or, you know, they would have an objection and that was fine. And so there was always an alternative text. Teachers have been doing this for decades, yeah. right? Yeah. There was always an alternative text that the student, there was no judgment. There was no hierarchical thing about you're not reading the real book or any of that. Schools have done that forever. Teachers have done that forever it, because there's, there's respect for having a different opinion, right? And thinking mm -hmm. this is not fit in my idea. So, and that seems perfectly right, right? Now, I think what we're talking about is, you know, parents feeling, uh, some groups of parents feeling like they can set the curriculum. They know what their children ought to read and they know what they don't want them to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other thing is if you teach, I think, I feel like no matter what you teach, what you're really interested in is truth. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of not, and I, and there are degrees and there are certainly conversations about when, like the seven-year-olds, do you need to like lay the whole thing out to the seven-year-olds? No. But the idea of, for example, teaching American history and in high school, which every, you know, that's required of every, in every state that, you, that a kid takes a year of American history, mm -hmm. U.S. history, and um, to not teach about the Tulsa massacre, to just not teach it, is, that's not the truth. I mean, that's not, so there's a rational middle I think in all that, but we're not there yet. And the other thing is, I think it's so political in the U.S. now. School boards are elected. School boards are elected. And people who are on school boards, except for the ones now who are like running for the exits, you know, they want to be reelected. They want to keep their jobs. And so it's a confluence of a lot of crazy stuff, I think. Yeah. Well, I think you make the point that it's always been like this. We, we, we've always had these uh, uh 
points of uh, conflict and pro probably in the past better uh, better managed in most cases than yeah. than now and you know we can go and blame social media how long do we have to do we have to blame social media just get used to it you know people got used to the radio people got used to television there was a, a lot of hysteria around you know radio when it first came out i think some people blamed the third radio for the third right uh but the uh the thing is you know and television was going to turn us all into couch potatoes and i think it probably turned some people into couch potatoes but we lived through that we got through that and it's time to get through this and and i think that i'm seeing the beginning of a kind of awareness okay a society educates itself and you know when when people it, the pandemic did not help because you're isolated you're not talking to your neighbor on the street and getting you know your bearing straight you know you're right. in this virtual world and people are screaming out and they're saying and doing things that they would never do if they were sitting in front of a person face to face in a meeting or you know so there's been a lot of bad behavior but i do think that we'll probably adapt and that uh the conversation will continue i'd like i'd like to be optimistic about it uh but i i don't see uh of course people running in and screaming about uh, uh socialist uh marxists trying to turn our country into whatever um the soviet union i don't see any uh that would be helping anything and i also on the side that i'm usually well i'm, a, I'm an academic you know to, to be haughty to be to look to, to seem to others as if you're looking down your nose at them you know and uh, that doesn't help either, or to, to call them stupid oh, or to do, you absolutely. know, that sort of thing. It just adds fuel to the fire. And uh, I, I found that when people, when they get settled down and, and look at things closely, then uh, you, you get a, a, a much more, uh, a much more chance for consensus. And at least uh, people can agree to disagree and get on with their lives and, and so forth. Yeah, I would say also just as a little coda to that about teachers and about the pandemic is in the beginning when the when the when schools shut down in in the US in March 2020 most schools shut down and they went virtual. Yeah. Almost all schools did and teachers had to really scramble to figure out how to make that that work and and lots of teachers lots of really terrific experienced teachers said I feel like I'm a first year teacher because I need, I'm learning how to do this on Zoom or I'm learning how to do this, you know, technology. But they, but they did it and went, but when kids started learning at home, parents, there was this huge groundswell of appreciation for teachers. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, we get it. Even those who didn't get it before, your jobs are so hard, we are so admiring of you. <laughs> but that has dissipated. And, and then, I mean, I do think the worst job in the world to have in the United States right now is to be the superintendent of a school district because mm. you cannot win. Um, and because we just don't know, we're so, you know, in order to protect people, we're trying to deal with all kinds of stuff. But, but teachers now have been, that, that was a great groundswell of, of recognition for teachers. But since then, it has gone downhill pretty fast. And this school year that we're in the middle of is, is way feels way worse to teachers than last year uh -huh. um, partly so because they thought it was going to be better uh -huh. we all did mm -hmm. and partly because they i mean their tanks are on empty and they and this goes this um reflects on something that you said tom is teachers like everybody else they are worried about the health of their kids they're worried about the health of their parents and their grand i mean they're worried about everything and they're also taking care of a lot of people so so everybody's out of gas i think in some way yeah of course of course and so respect and listening and respect you yeah. know they, they come hard by when you're out of gas we're just out of gas <laughs> yeah there's uh, yeah. just no energy for that uh we just have to hope that we get on uh that we surface out of this that the kids can get back into school and stay there and uh i i just hope that's the case and I think once that happens, once the real world comes back into into play and is consistent and 
the teachers are get some of their gas back, you know, refuel a bit sure. and, the, and the parents settle down a bit because they're not worried about how you know, the day, how the, they're, the, we're going to have to quit our job to take care of our children at home and the other financial right. stresses, the stresses of, you know, of course, sickness and disease and elderly living in the house, all of those stresses subside a bit. I think that the conversation will get a, a little bit better. And I, I don't want to be a, a Pollyanna here, but I just don't. Uh, negatives just filled up. It's just right. it's, it's like no more room to develop, it, you know, in that area. The, 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 uh, there's just too much going on there. It's just not enough more. There's no more space for negative. And so well, and one of the things we know from teachers is something that really is appealing to students and that keeps on being appealing to students is literature. Yeah. Yeah. because and maybe you're teaching it in a different way and you're also maybe examining kinds of literature that are not really in the curriculum I mean I mean most really good teachers are thinking okay I'm going to jettison stuff that isn't going to make sense and I'm going to really pay attention to things that is going to capture the interest of teachers and in a lot of cases in English class that's literature in a lot of cases it's Shakespeare but in a lot of cases it's all kinds of poetry it's all kinds of different things and that allows kids to dive deeply into something and then talk about it and then ask the questions. And so that's all a part of the importance of the humanities, I think in general. Absolutely, we make it, and we, we, we are under attack all the time. And I'm thinking there's some uh, recent, uh, why do we need these people? What good are they doing? And there just seem to be a, a group of people. I don't think it's a large group of people who just don't like the, the idea of humanities. They think that we are doing something that we're not really doing all the way across the board. Uh, you can get one example of one teacher saying one, you know, anecdotal evidence of this or that. But I don't think there's a good, strong understanding of what uh, of the what is the public demand for Shakespeare for the humanities? There's a there's always been an enormous and this is regular people in regular jobs. They want this in schools, and they uh, they like that their children are learning to read on uh, a higher level or a more profound yeah. level. There's just a strong public demand for this. It, you you if you go to the other end and say, listen, okay, let's just take it out. There would be a public outcry what, you know, we're not going to teach literature in school anymore. We're not going to teach Shakespeare in school. And Harvard University says, nope, no more Shakespeare. Do, you know, does their reputation go up after that or what, right? And we all know this. And uh, in my classes, I have a lecture class. And one of the problems I've had over the years teaching is that 230 kids will show up for it. And that's too many. I can't use any of these <laughs> Folger method. It's very difficult when you have that's that right, many. for a big crowd. Uh, and so, you know, we go and we have, fortunately, we have film, you know, we can break things up a bit. And at least we have that uh, and, and good uh, productions. And we can examine what directors and actors, how they do certain things. So we can do that. But 230 people is too many. Uh, but it's because the Shakespeare is such a, a brand you know, an item, they, the kids want it. I think 30% are there because they see it is not much different from Dior or Gucci. It's, and we're in a fashion district uh, in our university. We're very, mm -hmm. very fa fa fashionable, fashionable Methodist, actually. We were founded by the Methodists, but a uh, very fashionable place. And about 30%, you know, I don't know about this, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, it starts out with, I thought it was about love and it starts out with a street fight. Uh, but the rest of them are there and they're at least always at least 30% who are just tuned in. They, they just get it and they want to know more and they sign up. Now I have a little seminar class also, which is more like in the tw uh, 12 to 15 student range. And that's where we can do some uh, acting and performance, mm -hmm. and, you know, presentation kind of things like that, whatever the, the individual student feels comfortable with. But it's, uh, it's, it, it's wanted here, you know, and so you, you, the question isn't why do you keep Shakespeare in schools and say, well, uh, what happens when you don't have any Shakespeare in schools? What are you going to get then? And it's not going right. to be us. Uh, you're not going to hear our voices. You're going to hear the voice of um, a guy who's working as a, 
there's a nurse, an attorney here or there, uh, a guy who owns a car dealership, uh, you know, people who are uh, shop owners in your towns, they, they'll be the ones asking the question, you know, why are we dropping this? Right. Well, and you know, something that the Folger is learning, you mentioned earlier about the construction that's going on there. We're, we have been closed to the public yeah, yeah. since before the pandemic, since January 2020, and we are adding a lot of gallery space. And we are also re reorganizing, reinventing a lot of our programs, I mean, for the public. Um, and because it just, well, our director, Michael Whitmore, who was really a visionary, and I I think he's a genius. I'm honored to be following him. The idea that that the Folger, which for a long time has really, I mean, we've had theater performances, we've had lots of programs, but essentially we have been turned inward and that we need to turn much more outward to the public in mm -hmm. terms of our exhibitions and our programs and our theater work, much more work in the community. And we're going to revamp a little, some of our local education programs too. But um, in, in anticipation of that, we also are looking for audiences of folks who've never been to the Folger before. And so last winter, we put together a program where we did some focus groups. We did some focus groups with different demographics, all different kinds of people, who, most of whom had never been to the Folger, all over DC, all over Washington, DC, some, a little, some in Maryland, but most of them in Washington. And we anticipated people who had never been to the Folger we anticipated that we would hear that they would say Shakespeare is a barrier to the fact that we've never been there. It's like, oh, you know, too much, too hard, too not interested, too dull, whatever. And, and that proved to be not the case at all. Um, people said, I've never heard of you, which is, says something right there. People says, Oh, that building, I thought that we have a very kind of a forbidding looking building that was built in 1932. Yeah, and yeah. people say, oh, I thought that building was a bank. <laughs> it, does, um, you know, yeah. it looks like a bank, but it's not Shakespeare. And so we said, oh, you know, part of this part of this reconstruction is we're going to have some lawn space. People said, what about jazz on the lawn? We said, yeah, what about it? Let's have it. So so the, Shakespeare was not. Um, was not a barrier at all, and we thought it might be. And there were lots of people who were parents or grandparents in these groups who said, I wanna bring my children there. I wanna bring my grandkids there. I want them to learn all this stuff. I want them to have all this stuff. So, so that's just kind of a reflection on, from, a, from a different perspective on what you were saying, Tom. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's just, it's, it's right on time. And uh, I know that at the Bodleian, they have a new wing that opened a few years ago and they basically opened it. Uh, you can, the Western wing, you can go in there, this little coffee shop, their, exhib their exhibits, their displays, their programs, their lectures for the public. And it's not just the Oxford scholar or the, you know, who has a, exactly. a reading card who can go in and, and see all the rare material. It's a feeling of, uh, of a public space too. And you do Absolutely. feel a part, you become part of it. And, and even though the, you know, the Folger is a private institution, but it very much uh, has uh, for a long time wanted to uh, have public outreach. There's a theater on, you know, in the complex, uh, right. in the building. Uh, and uh, there's another building right across the street on the theater side that's used for educational programs, I think. That's some offices, yeah. Our, the education department and also now development is in there some, and okay. also the, de the department that runs the theater and our poetry program and stuff. But, but you know, you, you hit on something that's really important is we have had public, so the Folger is not part of the government, even though we are right in the middle of all these government buildings, it's privately funded. Um, I mean, we get some government grants from NEH yeah, and so yeah, forth, but, yeah. but it's not federal at all. And even though we have had a lot of public programs, I don't know what, I mean, and part of Michael, Wilmore, uh, Michael Whitmore's vision is that we are we need to behave like a public institution right we need to we need to start thinking about ourselves and this is this has gone on for a few years now as a public institution and we welcome all kinds of everybody um, and we want to get them as close to our programs as close to the collection we want to offer them all kinds of interesting experiences fun learning um, 
great theater, wonderful poetry, all kinds of stuff, and have a social space. So our great hall, which has been our exhibition space up to now, which is a gigantically big room, yeah. is now going to be a communal space. Oh, good, good. And and there will be a bar there, actually, a, a little bit of a cafe and places for people to meet, for people in the community, like your book club can meet there or whatever. And then the the gallery space down below, the new gallery space that we're building, um, will be wonderful new and and all up to par in terms of what what needs to be physically what what the, how they need to be made so that the display of these kinds of priceless objects that we have we don't you know we, we always kind of we always had to worry about that in the great hall but we won't so the yeah. idea of throwing the doors open and saying come in um, and, and what we learned during those focus groups is people were like, yeah, we, we're really interested in this. Like, keep us posted. Tell us when you reopen. We want to come. We want to see what it's like. Yeah. So I, we're learning a lot. Uh, and are you getting closer now to the uh, grand reopening or whatever it is? Yes. No, yeah, we, we are getting closer, though. We have had some delays and those are those are those are made those are brought to you by the pandemic yeah. um but we will reopen in 2023 for okay. sure and that's the um anniversary of the the printing of the first folio that might be right on time i'm hoping uh, in terms of uh going if if that's the case it would almost be a perfect timing with pandemic <laughs> to close you know we hope which, so in, in some ways and you know, there's nothing for, fortuitous about this but uh it you know, the, the the sadness I felt of the Folger closing down, even though I was very happy about the plans, you know, uh, some of that was lessened by the fact that I couldn't have gone, you know, none of us could have gone there anyway to do any, any of the right. things that we, we do there. And right. so, so there you are. Uh, well, I did want to bring up one more point about the interpretation of Shakespeare, what we know and what perhaps the, a lot of the public doesn't know, because again, things get into the press and they get spread around and, uh, and you know, uh, people are told how, uh, what, uh, I'm using the example a few years back, uh, Peggy, so sometimes it feels like it's like a year ago and you find out it was seven years ago. You know how that understood. And, and, uh, understood. But there was a there was a hubbub about the tempest in Arizona, I believe. And I brought it up on another uh, conversation and how it was being used to do post-colonial. And these are uh, these are critical theorists and they're telling our children all of these uh, things about how bad they are. And this, and, and so there was a, a, maybe it's just a small group that, that thought that the tempest should be, you know, jettisoned, you know, here and there you get uh, plays and also novels, you know, Mark Twain is a, a great example where people, even on both sides uh, of uh, whatever issue there might, might be, uh, don't want that book in there, you know, but uh, it was the tempest. But again, going back to uh, James Shapiro's work, the tempest was used by him, Henry Cabot Lodge as part of his argument against immigration. It was used for very conservative, brilliantly, in a very conservative way to argue against more immigration into America. And then years later, and it has been picked up by post-colonial theorists. And I think there's been some wonderful work done on the play in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I, I do wish there were a way to, exp to express to people that I, I don't know of any example where any of my colleagues, anybody I know in the States who are on the, uh, who are teaching in high school or teaching in college, where they've gone in and told students, anybody, that they're bad people <laughs> and that they need to, I, so I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, well, I, th I think in teaching, you want students to discover things for themselves. You want to give them the tools so they can make some discoveries and ask some questions. And sometimes teachers come to study with us at the Folger in the pre-pandemic days and they would say, I want you to, I want to learn the correct interpretation of Hamlet or the correct interpretation of the Tempest or mm -hmm. you name it. Mm -hmm. And we say, I, yeah, well, there is no the correct. And see the people in that reading room you know, they, they've been there for a long time and, and the Folger would be out of business if there was the right way. So 
So that's one thing. And also what we want students to do is to, is to dive into that language, do some collaborative work with their classmates, and then come to some conclusions of their own about what they think their interpretation is. So, so that's one thing that, that your comment makes me think about. And then the other thing is about the Tempest. So, so we had 25 teachers from all over the country on Zoom because that's the only way we could do it last summer um, at, a, at an institute that was called Shakespeare and the Making of America. And there were two fabulous resident Shakespeare scholars. And then there was a, a really wonderful series of, of visiting scholars who were all historians. And the two plays were The Tempest and Merchant of Venice. Um, and, and, and we took a deep dive into all aspects of them. But the thing about, and we also just had a professional development session last night online. And the speaker was Mark Summers, who is the um, public humanities guy at historic Jamestown, the Jamestown Fort. So the interesting thing to me about Jamestown that I think kids are, or, or anybody, you know, forget like what somebody thinks it means or how it can be weaponized or whatever. It's like, how did we, so the idea that Jamestown, those, those, those little boats came up the James River, as this guy, Mark Summer says, with those men dressed in those funny clothes, those white guys dressed in those funny clothes, yeah. came up the James River in 1607. Shakespeare was writing plays then and we also, I mean, we don't know, but we think a bunch of men on those boats would have to have been second sons or third sons and they needed to find a life for themselves. They may well have gone and seen something at the Globe Theater. I mean, that's not, that's not a crazy thought. No, no. And we don't think of those things happening at the same time. So, yeah. so, and so then there's the issue of the wreck of the Sea Venture, which is a ship that was on its way to Jamestown. And in 1610, you know, was wrecked and dis and you know out of action. Um, and it was and the wreck of the Sea Venture was. There were other ships around who saw it. There were witnesses, and so there were written accounts of how the Sea Venture went down. And there also were images. People drew pictures, and then those were made into etchings and so forth. And that was a highly publicized in England, in London, because all the people on that ship came from London. And Shakespeare wrote The Tempest in 1611. And that is about a, an island, right? And it, it takes place on an island. It takes place on an unknown island. People are coming. It, it, the, there's a huge storm, which is act one, scene one of The Tempest. Um, and The Tempest actually has never been my favorite, I have to say, because there's only one woman in it. It's like, oh my Lord, there's all those men talking forever. And, but anyway. <laughs> So, especially that one guy, that Prosper guy who talks, ooh, <laughs> he talks oh, a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, but it's, an, so there are very, very interesting connections, right? And when you think about some of those connections, it's like, oh my gosh, like, what, you know, and then, and that's, and sometimes that's very interesting sort of historical context to give to students who would never think of those connections. And then, and then, you know, they're reading the play and they're like, well, what's going on here? And, and what about Caliban? And what about, you know, Caliban saying, I showed you all the best places of this island, you know, and now I'm, now I'm locked up. Now I can't. So I don't think anybody has to tell anybody that, but for students to find whatever they find in the literature and, and come to their own conclusions, which then they can change as they, those conclusions will morph and adjust as they grow older. But the idea that they, have the power to put some of these ideas together. So the idea of, of a teacher, wherever they are saying, this is what the Tempest means. It's like, mm, that's not really teaching, at least in my opinion. You're not empowering a student to do anything in that case. Yeah, and it would, the, the, the plays would not have survived uh, even the, the runs, the runs uh, the, their popularity on the stage during the 18th, 19th centuries, and then in their introduction to schools in the late 19th century and more, more early 20th century, uh, they, they wouldn't have done, if, like you said, if we could just read it and say, okay, this is two plus two equals four. 
right? If there were not those ambiguities, it would not have stood up against those swings and how, yes, it can be used for whatever this conservative position, it can be used for what we think of a more progressive liberal position. But if there were not these ambiguities, it would not have been uh, survived and it would, it would be of little meaning to us because there just are those ambiguities that, uh, right. that we come away with. And that, that uh, what I love is that uh, there, we're not told much about how the the stays uh, the plays were staged. Absolutely. We're not told much about how to do things in terms of blocking, in terms of wherever somebody's supposed to be. So modern directors and modern actors, and on any level, professional, amateur, in schools and so forth, right, can can get in there and can react, interact creatively with this. Let's face it, great poet, dramatic poet, and these great stories and this great material, they can collaborate with, with this uh, material. And it's very open to that in ways that perhaps a novel is not, or even a poem. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or other plays where the playwright gives very, very specific yeah. stage directions and and directions about how lines should be spoken and all that stuff well that's the kabuki tradition the no tradition is very prescribed yeah and uh, right. it's, it's brilliant it's excellent it's something but it's, it's uh you, you probably would find more shakespeare in tokyo than you would uh know in kabuki although it does you know it is here Surely. Um, Surely. yeah um yeah shakespeare is very very uh popular in japan and i uh, I've been writing about it recently, and it, it, well, it's an, on an educational theme. We're, we're talking about how to, uh, and I was working with my my graduate student who's Japanese, and she, of course, had Japanese education, and another very bright uh, scholar uh, who uh, she she did her work at Waseda, but they know, and they 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 grew up, you know all the way or part the way in Japan. So they know how they were exposed to Shakespeare and it comes through. Uh, there's a lot of private uh, theater activity, of course, but there's a lot in anime and manga and novels for young adult women primarily. Mm -hmm. And these people, these creative artists that are so excellent in, in these genres, you know, at the, at the upper end, they feel the freedom to do anything they want with Shakespeare, right? And they retain a lot too. They see, you know, they'll see the value of retaining this, but then they'll move it over to like 12th night, move it more to the young 18, 17, 16 year old woman mm -hmm. who, uh, who, who likes that gender bending and they'll push that and then they'll bring it back into convention That's at the end, that kind of thing. That's what we're working on. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, you know, you, there is that sense of freedom. And I think that we can learn from others and not just Japanese. I think this sort of thing is happening in uh, all over Asia. I think uh, if you looked into a number of African countries where Shakespeare is taught, that you would see some extraordinary creativity where people don't feel under the, the same yoke, uh, the burden of being authentic or, you know, of the iconic uh, image of respecting the the great bard or whatnot, and uh, and we can learn from that too, as well as from the Shakespearean text, from other cultures and countries, and how they. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Shakespeare's been adapted for, and by more than any other author, I think, probably. Yeah. I could say across the yeah. world. Yeah. Well, there's so much room for adaptation. Well, I wanted to just uh, finish up and uh, talk a little bit. What I loved in the bullet point of your excellent, just fine, just such an impressive career. And, and I love the fact that you're, you're, you know, moving, you know, onward. What else is there to do? But uh, this is, you know, it, it's, it's good. But the, uh, uh, you know, my, my wife and I talk about retirement and so forth. And I, I don't want to talk about it because I'm just not, I'm not ready. And, uh, and I feel like as long as I can be of some kind of help uh, in some way, in some capacity and doing the things that I'm doing, and I think you feel the same way, as long as we're in, let's, let's do it because it's, it's so, uh, it's so rewarding. You know, we've gotten so lucky, right. but, but the, uh, what I really, really love about your, uh, your career is that you started in DC schools as a teacher right there so that's yeah. you know that's that's like 
I guess in, if you wanted to talk to a military historian and you found that he was a frontline infantry person, uh, you, <laughs> that brings us a, a feeling of trust, you know, because just like in what people say about wartime, there's a lot of difference a hundred yards after the, after you get behind the front line. Right. right. And if, for, for people who have not had that experience and had to struggle, uh, that's, it's hard to when you do go into you've gone into more of a public relations administrative uh, role, you're now uh, doing both at the Folger, uh, but you carry that experience with you. Uh, and so I think that's uh, I'm, I'm just very impressed by that. I actually have a checkered past. My past is pretty it's a kind of a checkered past because I started out teaching English and I I mean, I had no people now, especially young people look at my resume and they say, oh, well, this is such an interesting career path. And I said, there was no path, planned, <laughs> right? I mean, there was no, um, but you know, I ended up working at the Folger. Uh, I had, I was teaching and then I stopped teaching because I had to take care of my parents who were sick. And then I was pregnant and had a baby. And then I was pregnant and had another baby. And um, I was about to go back to my teaching job when one of my neighbors said to me, oh, you know, the Folger, which is down the street from where I live, the Folger is looking for, not for anybody to do anything about education, but for uh, somebody to work out with their docent program. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'd love to get inside that place. Yeah. I mean, I've been to plays there, but anyway, so I, I went there and I thought that was going to be maybe a six month. I said, I'll do that for six months and then, and then I'll go back to teaching. But when I got there, I, I started working with the docents and that was great. And then I also realized that they didn't have any education programs for this guy who you cannot get out of high school in the United States mm -hmm. without reading some of, that's a terrible sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said that to the director and he said, well, you know, Peggy. So I started a lot of the education programs there and, and I was there for 13 years. I left because I kind of felt like I was out of ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I went to work for, I had another sequence of jobs. I've always been fascinated with how people learn mm -hmm. and how we teach people, how to teach people how to learn. I mean, that all that universe, Shakespeare is great fodder for that, for sure. But that's the stuff that really interests me. So I worked for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting for a chunk of time and, and helped to fund some, I think, pretty wonderful stuff on PBS and some yeah. on NPR and yeah. But all about, you know, kids learning, kids shows that would teach kids how to read. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I ended up working on the on the leadership team of the D.C. public school district when we had this new hard charging chancellor. And that I had never I mean, who would ever as a teacher, would you ever want to work in central office? No, <laughs> no. But this was really this was the bleeding edge of school reform. Michelle Ree was our chancellor. And so. I, I was um, the chief of um, public and family engagement, which was when we were closing schools all over the place. I mean, that was a hard job. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. It was really interesting. So I have seen sort of those worlds and the world of learning from a lot of different perspectives, in addition to my own family, right? Kids and grandkids and all that. And I was not um, in any way, I'd never even thought about going back to the Folger until I, until I ended up meeting Michael Whitmore, who by that time had been in this, the director's job for about a year, he, yeah. young, really yeah. um, energetic and visionary guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, who not only was a, is a wonderful scholar, but also had a really big idea yeah. about the Folger. And I, you know, have so such affection for this, you know, for the Folger and, and, but also real, a, a lot of energy for the whole idea of opening it up and bringing in lots more people and, yeah. you know, engaging a lot more people, having a lot more people bring stuff to the Folger. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it, that was kind of a no brainer. I was really excited to, to, um, you know, and I am not going to work here forever. Right. But, um, but I wouldn't miss this because, no. this is a, you know, it's a really, it's a very, it's a, it's an exhausting but really exciting time that is full of change. Yeah, and I think I, like I can that. I think I can speak to, uh, for a lot of teachers out there uh, that we had to learn. I mean, it was a crash course in in broadcast techniques and technology and yeah. us, using digital uh, new digital tools and that sort of thing. 
and it it was uh it was exhausting it still is mm -hmm. but i, I uh, uh, people who are younger than i am are going to come out of this with still th those capabilities we are learning how to do things i don't think my uh, curriculum has ever been as structured and organized and you know i i kept i, I was looking and i'm going my goodness i wish i i thought it was organized until we got online and then i realized you know i'm going to have to be far better here if I'm going to right. carry, carry right. the day online. And I'm going, why didn't I do this 25 years ago? My goodness. But it, I, I didn't need to because you could kind of, you were in the room with them and it was a, a whole different right. thing. And it, it, it's improved things. It's improved things. And uh, a lot of people are going to surface from this pandemic improved. A lot of teachers are going to find that they've improved and that they've developed uh, great skills. Uh, and and we we did it mostly on our own. We had to learn our, you know, there, there was yeah. there wasn't the ability to go to a seminar and, and get trained. I mean, there were some Zoom seminars, but uh, so there's there's some positivity there, I think. And also, I like that the the priority is given. Uh, I know that uh, I work I've worked with the team, the digital team at the Folger for uh -huh. the, the past two or three or years we're digitizing some of our rare bibles here and sharing them on the Folgers um, Miranda platform as uh -huh. uh, as more as a, a demonstration but also so people we had these bibles that really were not it wasn't easy to go in and see them nobody knew about them and the people who did would have to make appointments and then you, sure. you know that kind of thing and now they can at least see very uh high high definition images and that sort of thing but Anyhow, so we feel close to the Folger in that way, but I wanted our Japanese audience and also our international audience to know that no matter what, uh, where you're teaching, whether it's in a uh, school, high school, middle school, in a college, that uh, when the Folger does reopen, you're you're welcome there, and oh, and you can uh, you can do your research there, but you can also learn a lot about. Uh, strategies, teaching strategies in Shakespeare, those same teaching strategies are transferable into other areas of literature, very uh, yes, fluid, definitely. fluidly, I mean, just immediately transferable. And that uh, uh, if you're a Japanese university professor and want to learn more about how, what might be the best way to teach Shakespeare in Tokyo or in Kyushu or wherever you are, um, then you're welcome. And uh, it's not open yet, but uh, it's there and these programs are there. They are and, and would be most welcome, but also until then, until we are open, we are online and yes. we are online with a lot of these kinds of things. And the other thing that I would be so remiss if I didn't mention is just that shakespeare.folger.edu is the website where you can find free and downloadable editions of every Shakespeare play really yes. beautifully edited and recently edited as opposed to other online editions of the plays and the sonnets and Shakespeare's other poems. And, and they are so, they're, they're lovely just to read. I mean, so, they, and they're free to anybody. You yes. can have them, um, yes. but also they're great. They're also great for teaching because you can cut up segments and move things around. Yep. And they, and they, when they, when the folks at the Fulger the digital team at the Fulger put those together, they said, okay, like we've got these basic ideas and we're ongoing, but how do we make these useful for teachers? And so they really, they paid attention. Um, well, yeah, and we wanna, know lots of people use them. Yes, and there's a wonderful interface uh, there that I yeah. used uh, this uh, past two years. I used the Romeo and Juliet and uh in in uh, zoom teaching because uh, we've been in hy hybrid situations too sure uh, yeah. where uh, i can pull it up on the zoom share screen and uh in some cases students they i have they have a text and the text has annotations but this way the people at home and the people in the classroom can we're all on the same, on the same uh, page. page yeah right mm -hmm. and and that has been extraordinarily helpful that way and uh, so my thanks to the Folger there. Yeah, and I did want to point out that the digital development at the Folger 
that's that's another positive thing because it it prioritizes it and it pushes it and that's where the world is going and uh, peggy what i want to do is kind of close off now because i'm keeping you from your supper probably and <laughs> you know here i am i'm keeping you from having to think about cooking it actually so <laughs> all good well, there's another good thing too. I've done a lot of. Have you been doing more cooking over the past couple of years? And oh, absolutely. I'm the I'm the uh, family cook. You know the uh, uh, the the two people in immediate our immediate family living together. Uh, uh -huh. I'm the cook, and I I love it. It's been therapeutic, and I, and I think I've gotten better. But uh, yeah. you know, right? we uh, all have, I think. Yeah. So uh, thank you again so much for for coming in here and and speaking with us about the Folger. And I just wish all of you the best. I hope that I can see you in person soon. I hope that some of my colleagues here in Japan who have gone and visited the Folger can go can look forward to going back. Uh, and we might see you or somebody from the Folger over here at some point. We can't do uh, that kind of thing now, but we do want to uh, consider the Folger friends of Japan and friends, friends of the globe. Absolutely, and, and, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and see, you know, see a, a human face at the library, a, a, another. I've talked to several people involved there. Okay, so thank you so much. And thank please, you for the invitation. This has really been fun and enjoyable. So thank you. Mm -hmm.